Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of What You Gonna Cue. We want to apologize once again for our snafu last week, but I think we're going to make up for it this week with another great episode in which we highlight some of the best titles that Netflix has to offer, with our recommendations broken down into three categories. Instant Karma, where we recommend some of the best instant titles to watch before they expire. What the f*** is this, where we highlight some of the obscure or overlooked titles buried in the annals of Netflix. And For Your Consideration, where the recommended titles tie into a timely, predetermined cinematic theme. As always, I am one of your co-hosts, Jim Rohn. And I am Alex Rabinowitz. And we certainly hope that we didn't upset anybody with our little April Fool's prank, or we hope that nobody was fooled by some other nasty April Fool's pranks, uh, because unfortunately no technology exists where we can erase the memories of the things that have hurt us in the past. Technology to erase the things that have hurt us in the past? Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a movie oh. that I'm going to recommend in section one. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind is a high-concept romance from Mindbenders, Charlie Kaufman, and Michelle Gondry. Gondry directs Kaufman's script with Jim Carrey as Joel, a heartbroken man who, thanks to modern medicine, opts to have ex-lover Clementine, as played by Kate Winslet, erased from his memory. And I'm here to erase Clementine Krzyzewski. Eternal Sunshine was one of my favorite movies from the last decade. It's just one of those uh, mind-bending, high-concept films that doesn't get caught up in its setup. And it combines that science fiction element with drama. There's some really amazing results. It's imaginative, heartfelt, emotional, thought-provoking, philosophical. It's, it's, it's got, it works on so many levels, and it's got anything you could want in a movie. And before this, I mean, Gondry and Kaufman had both, you know, done other stuff, and then after this, they both gone on to do other stuff as well. But it was kind of a perfect storm of them coming together on Eternal Sunshine because their styles really accented and enhanced each other. Gondry was kind of able to rein in Kaufman's style, who, you know, he kind of tends to ramble in his screenplays and it go, goes all over the place. Uh, but Kaufman's um, pontifications and explorations were able to give a, a substance to Gondry, whose work can often kind of be style over substance more so. Yeah, it's writing and directing in perfect harmony. Kaufman in his writing doesn't let the constraints of time and reality box him in and the, the script won best original screenplay based on sheer ambition probably but then you have Gondry who is not only able to deliver on the more imaginative sequences in the film with his you know imagination and creativity and ability to really execute some wondrous stuff but he also makes it grounded in reality and infuses the film with the heartfelt emotion that this story really required. Certainly one of the reasons that people love this movie so much is because the romance and the, the relationship at the heart of it is kind of the anti-Hollywood romance, a lot more believable, a lot more uh, dramatic, uh, accented of course by the great performances from both Jim Carrey and Kate Winslet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it when Jim Carrey gets serious, mm -hmm. almost more so when he does his uh, comedic performances. Yep. Kate Winslet is really consistent, of course, as always, and the supporting cast is fantastic. Yeah. Even uh, Kirsten Dunst gets a passing grade and is tolerable in this movie. Yeah, and that's quite an accomplishment, I'd say. Uh, but uh, this is expiring, so like Jim Carrey's memories of Kate Winslet, how long until Eternal Sunshine is erased from instant? It'll be lost and gone forever uh, May 15th. Okay. But to assuage some of the grief that people may feel when it is removed from instant, uh, maybe they should watch the film that I'm going to recommend in section two, which is arriving on instant very shortly. <laughs> A group of British Muslims all have aspirations of becoming suicide bombers in the feature film directorial debut of Christopher Morris, Four Lions. Omar, Waj, Barry, Fossil, and Hassan are all planning on becoming jihadists, but they have to overcome the slight problem of all being idiots. A dark comedy farce, Four Lions premiered at the 2010 Sundance Film Festival and was the first film to be distributed by Drafthouse Films, a newly formed distribution arm of the famous Alamo Drafthouse in Texas. The way to stop the feds tracking you is very simple. You eat your SIM card. Can I cook mine? Four Lines will be available on Instant Soon, uh, April 7th to be specific. Uh, and I think people should watch it because even if they have not seen it yet, they I'm sure are aware of it as being that 
controversial film that a lot of critics, uh, you know, kicked up a fuss about because it supposedly cast suicide bombers in a sympathetic light. Yes, that's absolutely what it found controversy for. Um, but I don't think we should understate how funny and tense this movie is. And I'm remembering one particularly memorable scene that takes place in a college lecture hall that really sticks with you after the movie <laughs> and provides a jolt during the film. Yep. But I want to know what your opinion is on this issue of it um, making these suicide bombers sympathetic characters. I think mostly those criticisms are foolish because what Four Lines is first and foremost trying to do is just explore uh, the things that would factor into people making such extreme decisions and then also kind of poking fun of the idea of blindly following an idea without really thinking it through and without really understanding what it entails. There certainly are sympathetic moments, uh, specifically uh, revolving around the character of Omar, but those moments come not when he's trying to be a suicide bomber, but when he's trying to be a family man, when he's reading a bedtime story to his son, or when he's interacting with his wife. The kind of moments that all of us, no matter what nationality or religion we have, those kind of moments that we can all relate to. Uh, and I think the main reason why it's not sympathetic towards their cause is because these guys are really bad at being suicide bombers. It's just, I think, impossible to glorify a cause when it's depicted so ridiculously like it is in Four Lions. Um, but you really have to have an open mind to appreciate it, and I'm afraid we're going to offend all of our viewers and turn them off of What You Gonna Cue Forever. Right. Well, with all the jokes about public exposure, if you haven't already been turned off to What You Gonna Cue, then this movie's certainly not going to do it for you. Uh, <laughs> But why I think it's great that Four Lions is a comedy is because, as many comedians have said before, uh, if we can't laugh at a subject, um, then it has control over us. You know, the fact that people are able to laugh at, at such an extreme uh, subject shows that it's not controlling us, that it's not paralyzing us, that, you know, as they say, that they haven't already won. I agree. But some people are stuck in their ways. Yeah. It's societal norms. It's just... It's infuriating. Yep. And we know a thing or two about breaking out of norms, which is why we have some more recommendations for you with that theme. Section three. This weekend sees the release of Your Highness, and if you're not excited at the prospect of seeing Natalie Portman's Heininess, <laughs> then perhaps you are excited at the prospect of another comedy from David Gordon Green, who previously teamed with both James Franco and Danny McBride on Pineapple Express. Though it's his second comedy in his many films, David Gordon Green actually got his start as an indie wonder kid, directing these low-budget, character-driven dramas such as All the Real Girls, George Washington, and Snow Angels. We applaud the director for working off type, and in honor of him, we are going to dedicate for your consideration to the films of directors who were working off type. Yay! Wes Anderson journeys to the world of stop-motion animation for an adaptation of, yes, Roald Dahl. Adapting the script himself, Anderson employs some of his usual players to voice the cast of Furry Ground Dwellers. George Clooney, Meryl Streep, and Willem Dafoe join regulars Jason Schwartzman, Bill Murray, and Owen Wilson. Mole, what do you got? I can see in the dark. We can use that. Rabbit, I'm fast. Badger, demolitions expert. What? Since when? Only a few years ago, it would have seemed absurd for Wes Anderson to be directing an animated movie. He has such a specific uh, composition style, uh, pacing, and actors that he likes to use that for him to go into animation, you would think, oh, how is he going to be able to do his thing? But then after you see Fantastic Mr. Fox, you're going to say the exact opposite. How did he not go into animation before? And clearly he excelled at that venture, getting an Oscar nomination for Best Animated Feature. And like you said, after you see Fantastic Mr. Fox, then you kind of say, like, wow, not only was did he succeed at it, but the animation genre that he worked in actually kind of allowed his, his quirky visual style to excel, and it was really conducive to what he was already doing. Yeah, his, uh, his regular uh, deadpan timing, the, com the, the comedy, and the composition, you know, with a lot of center frames and, you know, characters and intricate backgrounds, and then just the wryness of it all is all wonderfully intact. And even the performances uh, that he gets from his voice actors are very similar to his past work as well. Uh, and the casting is just really dead on here. Uh, George Clooney, especially as the uh, cool Mr. Fox, um, isn't really that far away from his performance as Danny Ocean in the Ocean's Eleven films. And the performances are, are, are like you said, it's really a testament even more so to Wes Anderson as a director because he was working primarily with voices and not so much the actor's actions. He kind of, you know, had to express that through the little stop motion animation. I don't have a bandit head, but I modified this tube sock. We look good. Yeah. 
And it's great that it is stop motion and not CGI or hand-drawn animation because it gives us this feel of almost something tangible to it. Yeah, it's so charming in its lo-fi beauty. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a, a really unique quality to it, um, and it's just so rich in texture. The um, materials that he uses to create the characters and to make the backgrounds and backdrops, and then the lighting, it just it feels like you could reach out and touch it. And it's such a great juxtaposition to the more polished, uh, bigger budget uh, animated films that we've seen from Pixar and DreamWorks. Right. It's really just a clever, engaging, funny movie uh, for children of all ages. Yeah, vastly different from the film that I'm going to recommend. An examination of the unexplored side of an iconic character, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula explores the emotional side of the most popular vampire in history, as played by Gary Oldman. More a love story than a horror film, Dracula explores the personal loss the ageless Count suffered that caused him to renounce his faith centuries ago and the ominous threat that looms for London when he sets his sights on the beautiful Mina Murray. There's a sinister, darker side to him. I find irresistible. Now, Alex, Dracula is, of course, as I said, one of the most iconic characters in history. He's been depicted countless times in movies, TV shows, books and video games. So any story involving Dracula is going to hinge on who's cast as Dracula and how he's portrayed. So I think first and foremost, Gary Oldman, great performance, and the way that he chooses to depict Dracula as just this uh, charming, romantic, debonair kind of man who's like broken inside, I think is just was a great choice by Coppola and Gary Oldman. Yeah, uh, Gary Oldman is one of those actors who's just a chameleon and is able to transform and embody whatever role he's playing. Um, but the surrounding cast around him, do they provide the support that this film needs? Uh, one of the complaints against Dracula is uh, some of the casting, specifically the inclusion of Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder. Certainly makes it seem like somebody lost a bet and had to cast them to make up for it. But the other characters around them I think are great. You have Carrie Elwes, who plays this very kind of prim and proper gentleman, which is really great. Uh, an unrecognizable Tom Waits as Renfield, you know, Dracula's crazy assistant who speaks to the master through his padded cells while he's eating bugs. Hmm. and. Um, Matching Gary Oldman is Anthony Hopkins as Professor Van Helsing, the uh, crazy old buzzard who kind of, you know, everyone kind of looks at wearily, but, you know, is the one who knows exactly what's going on. She is a willing recruit, a devoted disciple. She is the devil's concubine. Now, with Fantastic Mr. Fox, we talked about how Wes Anderson's um, specific style translated very well to animation. Mm -hmm. How does uh, Francis Ford Coppola stay true to himself? Dracula was made during the time when Coppola was trying to work off his debts as a director for hire. And, and so his specific vision doesn't come through in Dracula, but he adds his own personal trademarks anyway. Mm. Some of the horror elements in it are very surreal. He has scenes where, like, where he has shot things backwards and plays them forwards to kind of unhinge you and make you unsettled. But then also uh, one of his strengths is working with characters and the fact that the character of Dracula, you know, a, a shape-shifting beast who kills people, drinks blood, and, you know, hypnotizes virginal women, the fact that we can relate to such a character and really feel his pain and you know kind of go through this journey with him is a testament to Coppola's strength as a director and it's really his personal stamp on the film. That's great mm -hmm. and I think we put our personal stamp on this episode. I think you're right so let's wrap it up. Once again guys we want to thank you for watching if you ever want to reach us remember you can stop by our Facebook page where you can post things to our wall including pictures of your queue. You can visit us on our Twitter account where we're probably always saying witty things. You can go to our website where we always have the latest news on what's going on in the world of Netflix, instant streaming, and just movie watching in general. And we have an iTunes page where you should listen to us and then rate us so we get a higher ranking. Thanks again, guys, and remember, until next time, hey guys, big gulps, huh? Well, see you later.